Thanks uh, very much, Stephen, and uh, all of you uh, here. It's been a, I've said it in each session, but it has been a privilege uh, to be with you and uh, genuinely count it an honour to be able to just minister amongst you. Uh, the work of GLOW um, is very close and dear to our hearts. And uh, having met some of you for the first time and others of you reacquainted and deepened our connections and friendships, uh, we want to commit to pray for you and to really walk with you in the, the work that God has called you to. Um, thank you too for the personal words of encouragement for the, uh, for the preaching. Uh, I really do appreciate that. I, um, uh, I think honestly much of, much of my preaching is born out of um, our own experience of brokenness, our own just walk. And uh, I think as we look, I think um, someone said, uh, maybe it was Andrew or someone, uh, one of the Australian guys who gave the epilogue yesterday evening said that when you look at these champions in Hebrews 11, some of them were complete wrecks. I mean, they were a mess. And you think, how did they get in there? <laughs> and then you realize that we're sat here and, uh, and you think that's just the way of God's grace and mercy to, um, to each of us. Uh, we're, we're thinking about, uh, we're going to focus on, on Jesus uh, right at the end of this uh, message. I want to just lead us to a place before Ryan comes back and uh, leads us in a song that will take us into a time of communion. Um, but we're thinking uh, this morning, or sorry, this evening about the champion of our faith. So we've looked at the foundations of living by faith. This morning we touched on some of the costs of living by faith, and this evening we're thinking about the champion of our faith. And we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 12. We'll put the verses up on the screen, just the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 12, and um, uh, listening to... Um, this is really the conclusion. The difficulty, of course, we have with chapter breaks is that we kind of think, right, chapter 11's over, but it, it is right through to this section of chapter 12. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. The writer of the Hebrews talks about giving up because we feel like giving up. It's true, isn't it? I mean, he talks about not giving up in other places. In the previous chapter, he says, uh, don't give up meeting together. Com continue to commit to love one another. Do not give up so that you won't become weary and give up. And let's be honest, sometimes we feel like giving up. It is tough, an illness, a bereavement, a loss, lack of fruit, our own coldness of heart. How do I keep going in these challenging times? What does God say? What has he said? I, I, I must admit, um, sometimes, uh, particularly in uh, the early um, 2000s, uh, in those years when I, I guess I was um, uh, facing burnout and didn't know that I was, I would sit in meetings and discussion and planning meetings for camps. We established a, a, a camp called Youth Trek. And I remember meeting with some of the leaders and they were enthusiastic and excited as we planned the camp. And I sat there with no enthusiasm, no joy, an emptiness rattling around in my soul thinking, how am I going to get through this? And sometimes when we listen to the successes and joys of others, we want to celebrate with them. But sometimes there's that, oh, that brokenness and that ache and that pain and that struggle and your own discouragement that's so difficult to lift your eyes beyond the storm that's raging around you and see Jesus. And maybe that's where some of us still are here this evening. So what does God say? What has he said? 
So there are some encouragements here, and I want to be uh, brief this evening, some encouragements for us to, to keep going. So the first one is this. Look at the swelling crowd and be encouraged. Look at the swelling crowd and be encouraged. Um, Hebrews 11 is really that um, gathering of a crowd, a stadium that's filling with people who are there to encourage you as you run your race. And the difference between this stadium of people in Hebrews 11 and the kind of stadium that um, some of these guys are going to watch Celtic, uh, John Spears, don't boo, uh, might be Rangers, might be Arsenal if you're me. If you go to watch Arsenal, it's 60,000 very quiet people, uh, not really cheering, not a lot to cheer just at the minute. Um, but uh, the, the problem with a football match is it's usually 60,000 people who know nothing about what they're trying to cheer on. The people who are the experts are on the field. And we all have an opinion about what they should do. For goodness sake, pass the ball to him. Well, from 100 feet up in the air, sat at the side of the pitch, it's easy to see. The joy of Hebrews 11 is that every seat filled by the spectators in the crowd is filled by a person who's run the race that you're now running and they've finished the course and they've kept the faith. That's good, isn't it? That's a real encouragement. This is a crowd of people who are there to encourage you, to cheer you on your way. The, the crowd is not one of anonymous faces. It's, it's more like that program British television used to run a series called An Audience With. Anybody remember those series, An Audience With? They'd have a famous person to do a performance, singing or comedy. But in the audience, it would be an audience full of famous faces. And the cameras would linger on the famous audience uh, members. It re reminds me, for those um, of, of uh, British background, of one of my favorite programs, Father Ted when uh, Bishop Brennan visits uh, Craggy Island and uh, Father Dougal, uh, who's um, not the, uh, the, the, the wisest um, uh, priest in the, uh, in the house, in the parochial house, uh, Bishop Brennan says, come on, come on, I have an audience with the Pope. And Father Dougal says, don't worry, Your Holiness. They repeat those programs all the time. <laughs> so... But, but this is an audience, a crowd, a stadium packed with champions who finished the race, who kept the faith, who won the prize. They've crossed the finish line. They've heard Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Look, look at why they're qualified to be in the crowd. Right at the beginning of Hebrews 11, um, we read, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So this audience, this crowd, are these people who've been commended for their faith. Let's just briefly remind ourselves of some of them who arrive. Noah arrives in the crowd. He's shown to his seat. He sits down. You see Noah arrive and sit down and you think, boy, that guy faced ridicule and mockery for 120 years while he built a boat in the middle of dry land, in a land that hadn't seen rain, never mind a deluge. That's mind-blowing, isn't it? You think, we have it tough? There's Noah in the crowd saying, come on, keep going. Abraham left home to go to a place that God was giving him, even though he didn't know where it was. And when he got there, he couldn't make it home. He lived in a tent. You find it difficult to live where you're living? Abraham's in the crowd saying, keep going. Jacob. Boy, how on earth does Jacob get a mention in here, eh? Jacob leaning on his zimmer at the end of life. I, I, I identify somewhat with Jacob in this. That I, I think often we pray, God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. As Jacob asked the Lord at the end of a wrestling contest. You remember he discovered who had been wrestling with all night. Neither of them had won the, the, the match. And Jacob discovers it's the Lord he's been wrestling with. And he grabs hold of him and he says, Lord, bless me. And the Lord who hadn't damaged him all night touches him, puts his hip out of joint. And Jacob, as far as we know, always leaning on a staff whenever we read about him ever after. God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. Okay, bang. Ow, I wanted a blessing. Yeah, that will help you just keep going. 
You'll remember. You won't forget. You walk with a limp. You run with a heavy sack on your back with a, a thorn in the flesh that you've asked God more than three times to take away. And he still hasn't taken it away, but he says, my grace is enough for you. Jacob's in the crowd saying, come on, keep going. It's all right. Don't give up. Don't give up. Joseph, who was so convinced that Egypt wasn't his home, that he left instructions. When you leave, don't forget, dig up my bones and take them with you. This isn't my home. Moses, who gave up the good life because he knew he belonged to another world. He says, keep going. This world is not your home. For the sake of Christ, he gave up the pleasures of sin for a season. And for me, there are other heroes. I mentioned some of them. Some you'll know, some you won't. One of my heroes was David Prosser, a man who I know meant much to the work of GLOW. David Prosser came to Northern Ireland in 1986. I was 18 years old. He came to the GLOW weekend at Castle Wellen. He showed some slides of, a, of an, a, a GLOW team in mid Wales at the Royal Welsh Agricultural Show. I don't know what it was about those slides or about David's presentation, but my heart was touched and I spoke to David and I said, can I come on the team this summer? And I went to the Royal Welsh Show team in 1986 and I'm still at the Royal Welsh Show team every year. My daughters have been part of the team for the last few years. I just love the outreach on that team. 1988, as David was facing a, a terminal brain tumor, Glow sent a note out saying we're desperate for team members on the following uh, team, particularly the Royal Welsh. David Prosser is on well, unable to fulfill the team, and I think there were only six or seven of us on the team. I, 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 I answered the call at the last minute, took an extra week off work, and came across to the Royal Welsh show. David Prosser was one of my champions of faith, and at the end of 1988, God called him home. Young man, young family, a stalwart of the early days of glow in the United Kingdom. He's in the crowd. See, for me, the, the, the chapter of Hebrews 11 is still being written. These people have taken their seat in the crowd, and I look, and I see them. I see my dad who went to be with the Lord in 2013. I, I, I remember my dad as he had dementia and was struggling with dementia, and his mind was gone. He, he rarely made any noises before he went into uh, the care home. He, he would talk sometimes mostly um, nonsense or asking the same questions over and over again. But one night he went to bed very early, one evening, about 7 o'clock, just because his mind was all over the place. And he, he got up again at nine o'clock, came into the living room. He said, I remember what it was I meant to ask you, son. How's the church plant going? And I, you know, no sooner had I started to tell him than he had forgotten he asked it. And he said, good night. And, and I thought, wow, what a moment, just a moment. You know, the, the thing in his lucid moment, just in an instant, it woke him up. He came in. He said, how's it going, son? Been thinking about the church plan. And I didn't get answering the question. It kind of didn't matter. It's just enough to know that it meant something to him. But he's in the crowd now he's saying, keep going, son. Don't stop. Run the race. Get to the finish line. It's worth it. Uh, Steve and Helen Cracknell have been here and they've gone. I probably wouldn't have shown this uh, picture if they'd been here. I'm, I've got the privilege of taking part in the funeral on Thursday of, of, of Steve's dad, Theo Cracknell, a, a, a man of God, a man who's had such an influence on a region, a farmer, a humble man who has had an influence in his heart. You know, every time he heard there was a new evangelist, it didn't matter where they were in England, he invited them to come and preach because he wanted to encourage evangelists, not just in England, but around the world. A man who cared passionately about the gospel. He'd gone home to his reward. On, the, on his last um, day of health before he took ill and spent a few days in hospital before going into the Lord's presence, I was talking to Rupert Abbott who said he was at the early morning breaking of bread on the Sunday morning, then at the, uh, the, the main uh, service at Glebe Chapel, and then on Sunday evening he led a service in ross on Wye, and then that night was taken ill, taken into hospital, and in a few days in the Lord's presence. Died with his boots on. Rachel's granddad uh, went to be with the Lord a number of years ago, and he was a man that we always said of him. He was a Gideon 
died in his 90s and uh, we always had the impression of him that he would go with his boots on. He used to go to Glastonbury to the music festival with the Gideon stand and loved engaging with the Glastonbury festival goers and giving them a gospel. Keep going. Don't stop. Run the race. Listen to the crowd. Dennis Pierce, who was one of my predecessors in the work of counties, said when his wife uh, Madge died uh, a few years before him. Someone said, so sorry to hear of your loss. He said, please don't mourn. She has left the land of the dying for the land of the living. She's left the land of the dying for the land of the living. Be encouraged. Throw off the shackles and run freely. Clean out the gutter in your mind, in your schedule, in your relationships. Get rid of unnecessary baggage. Eliminate diversions, distractions, detours, and time-wasting. Let us strip off every weight, Hebrews 12 verse 1. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Strip off anything, another translation says, that slows us down or holds us back. And especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up. And let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. Weights, sins, and expectations. Things to throw off. Weights. Don't run this marathon with weight you don't need to carry. This is, this is not running to be in the Marines. You don't have to pass an exam along the way. You need to strip down to just what you need. Get the essentials on and keep in the race. And in Christian ministry, we end up carrying a lot of baggage. Much of it is the expectation of others. And we need to strip it out and run the race that God has set for us. It's pretty specific. The sins, the sins that entangle us and trip us. It's easy for sin to crouch at the doorway, isn't it? We need to take a moral inventory and confess our sin and ask God to cleanse us. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why we need to keep coming to this table, isn't it? Say, Lord, I just need to be washed. I need to be made new. I need to be made whole again. Throw off every weight. Deal with every sin. And run your own race. Let others run their race. But you run your race. The course marked out for you. Run that race. And the key above all others. As I draw my uh, talks to a conclusion. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Focus on Christ. We do this, says the writer, by keeping our eyes on Jesus. I love the New Living Translation, which says, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. The champion. The champion. The expanded version of the Bible says, the pioneer, the leader, the founder, the prince. Think of David and Jonathan. I've been preaching just recently. We did a series in our own home church in, uh, in Wiltshire, in Melcham, uh, on Sunday school stories, revisiting Sunday school stories to discover truth afresh. And we were thinking of the story of David and Goliath. And I think of the story of David and Goliath as David goes down into the valley of Elah and he conquers the giant because his faith is in God. And with one stone thrown from his sling, he takes the giant down, takes his sword, cuts off his head, carries it through the camp, and takes it into Saul. And uh, the story doesn't, again, the chapter division just makes us stop at a point that I don't think we should stop at because you move from 1 Samuel 17 into chapter 18, and you read this. David has gone into the tent with the head of Goliath, and after uh, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 1 of 1 Samuel, after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them. For Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Who should have been fighting in the valley? Who was the champion? Well, it was Saul who was head and shoulders above the rest of Israel, but he was terrified in his tent. 
But there was a prince, Jonathan. And Jonathan hadn't got the heart perhaps to go and fight the giant either. But Jonathan watched David go, this boy, and bring down the giant and overthrow the Philistines. And Jonathan's heart was won as he watched his champion. And I love that passage because it reminds me of Jesus, you know. You and I face giants and we can't take them down. They taunt us and they mock us. And they hold us in their sway and we're fearful of them. But Jesus, our champion, goes into the valley of the shadow of death. And he looks our enemy in the eye and he dies on the cross. He who knows no sin is made sin for us. And he enters into death and death is disarmed. And he rises victorious from the grave and our future sealed and our eternity is certain. And we have a champion and like David and Jonathan, we need to just come and bring our stuff and lay it at his feet, our robe, our tunic, our sword, our bow, our belt and say, Jesus, it's yours. You're the champion. You're the champion of my faith. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Jesus, be the champion, the prince of my heart. I want to follow you. I want to fix my eyes on you again. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. And this was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Jesus. Sin is defeated. You don't have to walk a defeated life. Sin is beaten. Hindrances and shackles, burdens, failures, memories. The writer to the Hebrew says, fix, focus, deliberately choose to look. i got to be honest, I, when the storm hits, I find it so difficult not to be fully distracted by the storm. But looking at Jesus is a deliberate act again of faith. Lift up your eyes and look. Fix your gaze on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Brothers and sisters, there's a race mapped out for us. There's a crowd that's filling a stadium to cheer us on. There's people there from biblical history and people from our own history. And they're saying, keep running. Don't give up. It's worth it. And waiting at the finishing line for you, don't worry about whether there's a crown or not. There's a champion. There's a hero. As you were reminded last night, there's a treasure. Your treasure is Jesus. Your treasure is Jesus. It's him we run for. Like Eric Liddell, that great British uh, sprint champion who said, when I run, I feel his pleasure on my face. Run for Jesus. Run because of Christ and run the race because when you finish it, you will be with Christ. Therefore, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Mm -hmm.